All right, so um, we're going to start out today going over a little bit of the history of the atom, okay? some of the models of the atom, okay? uh, stuff like that. And um, yeah, just, it's probably all going to be a review for you, I would think. Okay, so alchemy and atomic models. So whenever I teach a lesson in this course, okay, it'll be, it'll correspond to a, a lesson in the note package, okay, in this case, lesson one, and there'll be key points, okay. I put the key points on there because those are the things that are likely going to appear somehow, some way on a quiz or test, okay, so they're the things you definitely want to be mindful of as we go through the lesson. Okay, so key points for today, understand how the theories of the uh, structure of the atom were developed. Why did people think the atom looked this way and then thought it looked this way and then thought it looked that way? Okay, uh, learn the parts of the atom and their characteristics. Okay, you probably already know those. Okay, what are the three parts of the atom? What's an atom made up of? Electrons. Electrons. Protons. Protons. Neutrons. Neutrons. Okay, that's the three parts of the atom, right? Okay, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, is our current understanding, okay? And the electrons are in a cloud, okay, um, surrounding that nucleus. All right. So, chemistry started out a lot different, okay? Before it became kind of a legitimate science, um, people used the physical and chemical properties of materials in nature um, to perform certain tasks or, or do things, okay? like tanning leather, okay? um, preparing foods, okay? or you know, keeping foods from spoiling. People understood that if you added salt to meat, the meat would dry out and then bacteria would grow on it, okay? uh, things like that. So they were using the properties of matter without really understanding why those properties were present or how they worked. They just knew they did work. Okay? History is full of situations and examples of humankind understanding um, this works, not understanding how it works. Okay, um, and then that often comes later. Okay, so that's kind of how chemistry started out. Okay, people didn't have as much time to study the whys, but knew that knew the hows. Okay. All right. So early on. Okay, there were different ideas about the structure of matter. The Greeks were kind of the first true kind of academic culture okay, um, of the world that was, you know, took time to study things and kind of hypothesize how things worked and things like that. Okay. The first person to have the idea that matter might be made of atoms was a Greek philosopher named Democritus. Okay. Um, so Democritus, you know, was a contemporary of like Aristotle and, and other Greek thinkers like that. Okay. Being a Greek thinker in ancient Greece was the best job you could have. Okay. All you had to do was sit in the Parthenon and people would feed you grapes and wave palm fronds at you and you know, keep you shaded and whatever. You just had to come up with good ideas. Right? Now, Democritus one day started thinking that maybe matter isn't made of three elements. Maybe matter is all made of tiny little particles that we can't see. Okay? And um, on that particular day, even though he was actually right, that idea was not well accepted. People were like, dude's been out in the sun too long. Okay? He's coming up with crazy stuff today. Okay? Because everybody at that time knew that matter is made of earth, air, water, and fire. Okay? Because that's what everything is made of. Okay? And that idea made good sense to the ancient Greeks. So there was no way they were going to accept this idea of indivisible or invisible tiny particles that everything is made out of, because that made no sense. Okay? They essentially had a periodic table of sorts for all the matter they were familiar with. Okay? So something like um, steam was some parts water, some parts fire, and some parts air, because those were the three things that had to combine to make steam. Okay? Lava. Okay, because we increased there were volcanoes. Okay, lava was some parts earth, some parts fire, and some parts water because it could flow. Okay, Th these were things that were practical and made sense to the people of ancient Greece. Okay, um, and so it was difficult for them to accept other ideas because there wasn't any backing for those ideas. 
And he said, so if these particles are tiny, people are like, well, show them to me. Well, I can't. They're indivisible. Indivisible or invisible? Both. Okay. People are like, yeah, not so good. Not a great idea. Okay. Wasn't all bad for Democritus. He did have some good ideas. Democracy. So it wasn't all bad. Okay. Um, now, during the Middle Ages, okay, we still don't have a, like, an authentic chemistry as a science. We have alchemy. Alchemy is what you would picture like the dark room with the you know boiling little flasks and beakers and some hunched wizened old person in there, okay, you know, mixing stuff together and, and experimenting. That was alchemy. Okay? The goal of alchemy was to do a bunch of things that we now, because of our understanding of the nature of matter, we know to be impossible. Okay. They were trying to, you know, make the elixir of life or the elixir of eternity, okay, or immortality or whatever. And so they would make up these potions and well, drink this. You'll live forever. Okay, well, let's try something else. That one didn't work so well, right? Um, and so the other thing they were trying to do was turn common substances into gold. That was the really big one. Okay, I got this pile of lead. Lead's cheap. I want to turn it into gold. There's got to be some way to do that. Okay? We know logically today there's no way to do that. Okay? But at that time, they knew that if I mix this thing together and this thing together, I get something totally different. Why can't I mix something with lead and turn it into this? Okay? What they didn't understand is what they were doing was causing chemical reactions. They weren't taking one element and trying to turn it into another element. You can't do that. Okay? But you can react things together and create or not create so much, but produce something else, okay? which would be another compound or something like that. They didn't understand the difference because they didn't understand the nature of matter at that time. Okay? So it was logical for them to assume there had to be a way to do that, okay? even though obviously now we know that that's not true. Okay? After alchemy, which was a very secretive process, okay? people discovered stuff they didn't share it with anybody else. Um, Roger Bacon and Antoine Lavoisier kind of took alchemy and they turned it into something better. Okay? They turned it into chemistry using the scientific method, which involves not just trial and error. Okay? Alchemy was a lot of just trial and error. Okay? The scientific method says, here's a problem that needs to be solved. Here's a hypothesis that says, here's an explanation for that problem. Here's a procedure that's going to test that problem that's controlled. Here's the results. Here's the analysis of those results. Here's the conclusion that can be drawn from the analysis of those results. And now I'm communicating all of that with other scientists so that they can replicate and verify my experiment. Okay? That's the most important part of science, any science, is the sharing and verification, independent verification of results. That didn't go on during alchemy. Okay? That, that made science progress a lot faster because okay? it wasn't all kept a secret. All right? So they're kind of important in that way. I'm never going to ask you directly who was Roger Bacon or who was Antoine Lavoisier. It's just kind of a history progression kind of thing. Okay, so if we take an element, like let's say lead, okay? so I have a lump of lead, and I keep cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces, do those small pieces all have the same properties? So I have a chunk of lead, all lead, and I cut it in half. The two halves have the same properties as the single chunk, other than its size. Because they're both made of lead. If I keep cutting that smaller and smaller and smaller, all those small pieces are still lead. They all still have all the same properties. They have the same density, the same um, atomic mass. They have the same melting point, boiling point, all of those things, because they're all made of lead, no matter how small I cut it. Okay? Now, not that it's possible, but let's say I could cut it down until I couldn't cut it any smaller. I'd have atoms. I couldn't see them, but let's say I could do that. Okay? Would all of those atoms also be lead atoms? They would, and they would all have the same properties. Okay? I can't turn lead into something else. It's an element. Okay? It can't become more simple than that and retain the properties of lead. Now, can I split an atom? 
under the right conditions can atoms be split. Yeah, not not like I can't take a knife and split the atom while I'm like chopping carrots. Okay, like luckily that's not something that can happen. The sharp edge of your knife is millions of atoms thick. Okay, you don't have to worry about ever having that problem. Okay, but if I could just split an atom, okay, would now the properties of the two parts be different? They would. Okay, if I take an atom of lead and I manage to split it, I no longer have lead. I now have two particles that have a different number of protons different number of neutrons, different number of electrons, okay? And that's what happens in nuclear processes, okay? We change what we have, okay, at a physical level. Okay, so the big thing from this is that an atom, okay, is a particle, okay? It's the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element, okay? The properties of an element are due to the number of protons that element has in its nucleus. If that gets changed, it's no longer that element. Okay, and it's the protons only. Because the number of neutrons can change, the number of electrons can change. It's the number of protons that determines the properties of that element. Okay. Questions on that? Okay, so after Bacon and Lavoisier kind of get chemistry going, people have been doing experiments in chemistry. They've been doing experiments where chemical reactions are involved. They've been, you know, seeing how matter behaves, recording it, you know, discussing it, things like that. And they've discovered some patterns in the behavior of matter. Patterns that seem to disagree with the idea that all things are made of four elements. Okay? A lot of their discoveries cannot be explained by earth, air, fire, and water. Okay? The nature of matter must be something more than that. Okay? So, a guy named John Dalton comes along, and his experiments have shown uh, some things about how matter can move, how matter can change, and things like that. Okay? And so what he came up with was the atomic theory, okay? that we still today essentially accept all the points of. The first point is, back to Democritus. All elements are composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms, okay? Not invisible, indivisible, okay? Because at the time of Dalton, people were unaware that atoms could actually be divided, okay? That they could be split or that some atoms actually do that on their own, okay? What we're talking about here is physical or chemical changes, okay? If I have a chemical reaction, I'm not changing the atom. I might change who they're with, okay, their arrangement, but I can't actually change the single atoms, right? So everything, all elements are composed of these tiny indivisible particles called atoms, okay? Second point, all the atoms of the same element are identical, okay? So that chunk of lead we were talking about, every single atom in that chunk of lead is the same. That's still, for all intents and purposes, isn't 100% true, okay? Is it possible that in that chunk of lead, I might have a couple of lead atoms that are a little different, okay? What we call atoms that are of the same element, but are a little bit different, it starts with I, usually associated with Isotopes. Okay. An isotope is an element of an atom that has a different number of neutrons than the rest of the atoms. Okay. So, how many people have heard of carbon dating? The process they use to determine how old things are. Okay. Or radiometric dating. Okay. Well, what they do with that is they know that in something that's newly produced, there's a certain ratio of normal carbon atoms to carbon-14 atoms. Most carbon atoms have six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. But there's a small number of carbon atoms in any amount of carbon that have six protons, eight neutrons, and six electrons. They're bigger, and they're less. 
less stable and they break down. Okay? So the age of something can be determined by looking at how much carbon-14 is in this old thing compared to something that's new and how much of the material breaks down into this present and they can determine its age. Okay? All things have isotopes. Okay? So while this is still effectively true, okay, isotopes are a bit of an exception. Okay. Third point, atoms of different elements can combine with one another in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. Okay? So the important part of point number three is that this whole number ratio part. You never have parts of an atom in a reaction. Okay? So if let's say I was looking at a reaction like this. reaction, I have four hydrogen atoms, two oxygen atoms, and they combine to form two water molecules, which still contains four hydrogens and two oxygens. Okay? So I haven't created any matter, I haven't destroyed any matter, and I haven't got any pieces of atoms left over. Okay? They're always going to combine in whole number ratio. Okay? Because I could also write this reaction like this. I could say um, like H plus half of O gives H2O. Can I have half an oxygen atom? The ratio is still 2 to 1, but it's now not whole numbers of atoms. Okay? Half an oxygen atom is Beryllium. Okay? It's not the same thing. Okay? So you're never going to have fractions when you're talking about atoms. Okay? That's what point number three is basically talking about. Okay? And um, the last point is the death blow or the last nail in the coffin for alchemy. Chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated joined or rearranged. However, atoms of one element are not changed into atoms of another by a chemical reaction. So, when I wrote these reactions here, so I had this. I started out with hydrogen and oxygen. What did I end with? Water, which is made of hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? I can't have this reaction. Okay? I can't say, I'll mix sodium and chlorine together, and that'll make gold. Okay? That's turning elements into a different element. I can't have that. I could have this. changed elements into something else. Okay? So whatever I start with, I have to have those same elements on the other side. Okay? So this would be an example of atoms being joined, just like this was. Okay? I could have a reaction like this. Uh, that would be atoms being separated, a compound breaking down into its two elements. Or I could have a reaction like this. Okay, that would be atoms being rearranged. Okay, but on 
both sides of the reaction, I have the same elements. I haven't created any new elements. I've made new materials, but I, they're still made of the stuff I started with. Okay, so everyone kind of follow me there? Alchemy thought they could do something else. Okay? They thought they could take these things and make new elements on the other side. You can't do that. Okay? Chemical reaction doesn't work. All right. So, would the four points of Dalton's atomic theory be something that might be important for you to know? Definitely. Yeah. Put a star around that, circle it, whatever. Okay? That's prime multiple choice question kind of territory on the unit exam. Okay? Certainly it's quiz worthy. Okay? Putting, being able to put them in your own words okay? would probably be something that would be important. Okay? So we still believe that these four points govern the behavior of matter in the physical world. And they do. So Dalton comes up with this theory. It's very unifying. It's a big deal. Like chemists everywhere are totally on board with these ideas because these ideas are supported by their experiments. Okay? They've seen matter do exactly these things. They've never seen it do anything else. But the next natural question posed to Dalton is, OK, great. What do these atoms look like? To which Dalton's like, well, didn't you read my points? They're tiny. I have no idea what they look like. I cannot see them. And they're incredibly small, which is not a very satisfactory answer, as you can imagine. Okay? So they're like, well, if we know how they behave, can we infer what they might look like? And Dalton's like, OK, uh, they're little spheres. Okay. I mean, there's nothing to say they're not, at least at this time. Okay? People don't know about protons, neutrons, and electrons at this point. They just know matter does these things. That can be explained by all atoms being tiny little spheres. Okay? They can go together. They can come apart. They can rearrange. It fits. Okay? Spheres are a very common, naturally occurring shape. Okay? All the planets and everything were, were spheres. Okay? If you think you're flat at this point, you're not going to agree with me. But you're wrong. Okay. But yeah, that sphere is a very naturally you know, common shape. So that's fine. People accept it. All right. Dalton says atoms are solid spheres. Hence, Dalton's solid sphere model of the atom was the first model of the atom. People go on their merry way. More experiments are performed. One of them by a guy named J.J. Thompson. He was performing experiments in electrochemistry. So he was causing reactions or studying reactions that produced electric currents. Okay? He found that when certain things were combined, electricity could be produced or flow from that reaction. The problem with that discovery is that that cannot be explained by atoms being a solid sphere. Because something has to come off of them to produce the electric current. And there was nothing in the atomic theory that said, yeah, pieces of this can come off. And they're charged, and they can flow, and electricity can do work, and all of that kind of stuff. There was no way that this model could explain that. So it had to be modified. Okay? And this is the process of science. We have an idea, a theory even. Okay? And a theory is not, like, the way we talk about theories in kind of common practice, oh, it's just a theory. Well, no, that would be, it's just an idea. A theory is something that's been backed up by repeated research, verified. Okay? Doesn't mean it's 100% right. A law would be something that would be more like that. Okay? But a theory is something that, you know, is supported, but maybe not 100% confirmed. So, this was the solid sphere model. Okay? Once these electrochemistry experiments were performed, they said, OK, this model no longer explains what's going on. Therefore, this model is no longer acceptable. 
we need to come up with a model that explains where the electrical current is coming from. So the natural idea is to say, we're going to make particles called electrons because they're part of electricity. Okay? So we'll call them electrons and they're negatively charged because that's what flows through a wire. Okay? Moving electrons. So this model gets put to the wayside. J.J. Thompson comes up with something very similar. Still okay with the solid sphere, but now embedded on the surface very loosely are tiny negatively charged particles called electrons. In a reaction, the atoms get shaken up and these electrons come off. Okay? And then they flow through a wire, okay? and that's where the electric current comes from. Everybody's like, hey, that's great. You know, you're showing respect to to Dalton by kind of keeping the solid sphere, but you've added a thing to it that explains your findings. We all like this idea. The problem is it didn't last very long. People start doing more experiments and they start discovering that, okay, but now there's this thing going on. And how does that explain? Why is the why are our calculations for the mass of things always off? If it's just the solid sphere and these little things, why can't we calculate stuff properly? Our data says something else when we do an experiment. So they keep changing the model. They keep trying, they keep changing it to explain protons. They change it to explain neutrons. Okay? They change it to explain all kinds of things. And it comes to a point where there's a whole bunch of models out there. Okay? And they all are okay. None of them are great. None of them are unifying like the solid sphere was when it first came out. Okay? So there's stuff like this. There's stuff like this. People are not sure. Okay? Um, so more and more experiments are in this kind of this period of time where people aren't sure. People don't know what's going on. Okay? Um, so a guy named uh, Chadwick comes along. He discovers protons. Or pro he already knows about protons. He discovers neutrons. That helps with some of the calculations okay, for mass and stuff like that. So now we know, all right, the atom is made of three parts. But no one knows the arrangement of these three parts. Okay? They know electrons are small and essentially massless because when a current runs through a wire, you don't see a big change in mass. Okay? Um, so he knows the bulk of the mass is in the protons and the neutrons, but nobody's sure where everything is. Okay? Some people like this solid idea still. Some people like this idea of a nucleus. Okay? But nobody can prove either one because atoms are tiny and nobody can see them. So a lot of experimentation goes on to find out what is the atom look like. Okay? And to this day, we haven't really resolved atoms visually to the point where we can see one. Okay? But we have experiments that have told us this is what they likely appear to be. Okay? And the person who came up with that was Ernest Rutherford. Okay? Ernest Rutherford performed an experiment that at the time was like revolutionary and not at all what he expected. Okay? He was trying to prove the shape of an atom and what he did is he did an experiment where he had essentially like an x-ray machine, okay? So a source of alpha particles, essentially neutrons, okay? He was gonna shoot them out at a piece of gold foil. So you guys know what like tin foil is like, right? Like the consistency of tin foil. So imagine you have something like that, but it's made of gold and it's more like a Kleenex in terms of like how thick it would be. Okay? So he's got this really thin piece of gold foil. It's only a few atoms thick. Okay? And he's going to shoot neutrons at it. Now, his idea is if atoms are solid spheres, almost none of these particles are going to get through. They're all going to bounce back. But if atoms are made of a central dense nucleus and electrons, which are tiny, orbit this nucleus, then some of these neutrons will get through. Okay? In fact, he thought all of them would essentially get through. He thought atom, the nucleus of an atom was that small. Right? So he set up this experiment, and around the gold foil, he put what is essentially like photographic film. Okay? Now, I understand there's a bit of a generation gap here. You guys have probably never used a camera that has film in it. Okay? Cameras used to have this stuff called film in it. Okay? And when you would expose it to the light, it would change color. And that's how you made the, how you made the image. Okay? So you essentially put that around this gold foil. Anywhere where a neutron would hit it, it would be like when you get an x-ray. 
that part of the film would change color. Okay? His prediction was he was just going to get a spot behind. Everything was going to get through. When he performed the experiment, this is the result he got. Some of the atoms didn't get through. They were deflected. They got through, but their path was changed. Some of them bounced back, okay? which was shocking to him. He said, that's like shooting like an artillery shell at a piece of paper and having it bounce back. Okay? Like that's, how, that's how he explained it. So, so atoms have a central dense nucleus. It's bigger than he thought. And electrons must occupy the rest of the space. So essentially, all matter is actually a lot of empty space. Okay? But atoms can be packed very tightly. Okay? Had he done this with a thicker, like a bar of gold, what would have happened? Yeah, they all want to bounce back, right? It's too many atoms, right? They're packed in there really, really dense. The key to this was that the foil was really, really thin, okay? And so it was only, as we see in this diagram here, a few atoms thick. So there was enough space for some of those particles to get through, okay? But some of them would encounter the nucleus of one of those atoms and be deflected, okay? Kind of like when you, you know, shoot the uh, cue ball when you're playing pool, right? If, it, if you make a bad shot, it comes right through and doesn't hit anything, okay? If you were trying to hit something straight on and you just got a piece of it, it deflects it off in another direction, okay? So that's kind of what happened there, okay? That was the explanation for his results. So it was a groundbreaking experiment because it proved the nuclear model of the atom, okay? All atoms have a nucleus. Surprisingly, that didn't settle a lot of arguments. Okay? It actually settled the, okay, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, but now what are the electrons doing? Everybody wanted to know what the electrons were doing, which was also next to impossible because you can't see atoms. How are you going to see electrons? They're even smaller. Okay? Uh, so more experiments were done, okay? and people came up with lots of different ideas about, okay, we're all good with the nucleus. Here's what the electrons are doing. No, here's what the electrons are doing. No, here's what the electrons are doing. Okay? And while we still accept some of them, there's kind of one that's better than the others. Okay? All right. Um, so if we were to take a picture of an atom, if we could do that and freeze it in time, it would probably look like Bohr's model or the planetary model, electrons orbiting the nucleus. That's what it would look like because they'd be frozen in time. Okay? Um, we still often draw atoms like Bohr, okay, like this. But what Bohr didn't realize is that electrons don't stay in these places. There are places where you can find an electron, not an orbit, but what we call an orbital. Okay? And that's a region where there's a high statistical probability of finding an electron, but it's not a perfect circle. And electrons can leave one orbital and go to another when they gain energy. When they lose energy, they'll fall back to lower orbitals, okay? Um, and so Bohr didn't really know that when he was coming up with his model, okay? So we kind of accept Bohr, but we really accept more de Broglie's electron cloud, okay? That kind of accounts for this bouncing around of electrons, okay? which we'll talk more about on Friday. I'm gonna leave it at that, okay? Um, so for Friday, Okay, um, if you guys can decide how you want to do your notes, okay? If you're going to have them on paper, have them on paper, come with, with that. Okay? If you're just going to use your phone or you're going to use a tablet or a laptop, I'm okay with that as well. Okay, um, just kind of have that figured out for Friday. Okay, remember in the next couple of weeks you need to uh, acquire a scientific calculator of some type. Okay, all right, questions from you guys? We'll leave it there. We've got about uh, three minutes or so until the bell goes here.